Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Hey, when we say the Lord bless you, I don't know if you know what that means, but, but it, it literally means something like the intention of God, the heart of God, the favor of God just be upon you. And when we say amen, we're saying it's true. Like, like we're choosing to believe that, that the heart of God is for us. And so it's just good to, uh, it's good to sing that and proclaim that together. And wherever you are in your story, whether you believe what I just said or whether you're fighting to believe what I just said, um, we pray that God would meet you this morning. So um, if you have your Bibles, why don't you open up to the book of John, uh, chapter 4, and um, we are in a little mini-series that we do every single January, and we call it Foundations, and if you've ever built anything, you know that, that you don't begin building with nails and wood and hammers and windows. You begin building with excavators and concrete and digging down, because if you want to build something uh, that will stand the test of time, build something you begin with a foundation, okay? And year after year after year after year, we love to go back to the very foundation of this church. And basically, we like to look you in the eyes and say, this is who we are, and this is where we're going, and, and do you want to lock arms with us and be a part of a church like this, because this is where we're going? And if not, God bless you, we love you, connect to some church somewhere, but we want you to know where we're going. And so last week... Um, I brought us to the story of our name and our namesake. And we looked at Acts 11, at this group of people in this city called Antioch, the foothills of Lebanon. And we saw this group of people, and you remember some of the qualities of their life? You remember this from last week? They were, um, they were Jesus-centered, and they were spirit-filled, and they were loving towards others, and they were... They were gathering and fasting and worshiping together, and they were just this awesome community that God used to change the world. And we said, gosh, we want to be like that. And we drew one arrow over their life. And this is, this is kind of the main, central, primal arrow of our church, and it's an upward arrow. And we said this was a community that said, if we get all things wrong, we will get the number one direction right. We're going after Jesus. And they said, we're, we're in this community that's broken, but we have the hope of Jesus. Uh, we're in this community that, that is full of darkness. We have the light of Jesus. And we want to be a church that, that says, we're going to be radically Christ-centered, okay? We will reach our lives upward. And today, um, I'm going to show you the second arrow, which is an outward arrow, okay? The people in Antioch said, this news of Jesus Christ is so good and life-changing that we, just, we can't hold on to it by ourselves. We've got to share it with others. And they brought the message of Jesus to those in their life who are far from God. And we want to do that too. Um, and so this morning, I'm going to teach a cool text, but I'm also going to do something that I love to do. I'm going to kind of put my vision hat on, and I'm going to say, Hey, by the way, do we like meeting in a YMCA? And do, do we have a purpose for meeting here, or are we just like renting a room until we can get quickly out of here? And if you've been part of the story of this church for more than a few years, we have met in many different places, haven't we? I mean, some of you kind of give me some, like, uh, like at least visual acknowledgement if you remember this. Do you remember... Um, being in the downstairs gym and having to, if you got there late, sit on the running track and kind of look out over the net and through the bars of us at church. You remember that? Um, and we've done, uh, hey, we're about growing this space. What are we going to do for holiday services? Well, how about a soccer arena? Has anybody ever done church on AstroTurf? I don't know, but we're going to try it. And we've like done it there. And uh, global pandemic hits and we're outside pool pavilion, murals of palm trees in the background, just praising the Lord because it doesn't matter where we meet, but that we meet, and there's something, there's something sacred and significant about our calling of being here. So you're going to see that as we kind of unpack God's word today. So John chapter 4, very famous chapter. We love it here. It's primal essence who we are here. 
the woman at the well. And this time, instead of reading it to you, can I do something a little bit different? Um, we're going to watch a video clip um, of The Chosen, and we're going to see the scene of the woman at the well. Okay, so why don't you tune in and let's watch this together. Give me a drink. Did you hear me? That's bad, huh? What? You, would you ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan? And a woman? I'm sorry. I should have said please. You know, it's not safe for you to be alone out here. Nor you. Why haven't you come with others? Why so late in the day? Don't women come to the wells in the, the cool of the morning? Yeah, well, none of them will be seen with me, so I have to come out now in the heat, as you have so kindly reminded me. Why won't they be seen with you? Long story. I, I'd still like a drink of water if you can spare it. Amazing what a parched throat will do. Aren't I unclean to you? Won't you be defiled by this vessel? Maybe some of my people say that about your women, but I don't. Yeah? And what do you say? I say if you knew who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink. Really? And I would give you living water. Would. Except that you have nothing to draw water with, and this is a deep well. Besides, what do you need from me if you have your own supply of living water? Wrong story. But Jewish water is better than Samaritan water. Hmm? That's not what I said. Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well? Your water is better than his? I know, Jacob. And everyone who drinks this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. Wouldn't that be nice? The water I give will become in a person a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Really? Yes, really. Prove it. First, go and call your husband and come back. I will show you both. I don't have a husband. You are right. You've had five husbands. And the man you're living with now is not your husband. <laughs> oh, I see. You're a prophet. You're here to preach at me. No. Usually the one good thing about coming here alone is I can escape being condemned. I'm not here to condemn you. I've made mistakes. Too many. But it's men like you who have made it impossible for me to do anything about it. How? Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews insist Jerusalem is the only place for true worship. They say that because the temple is there. Yeah, exactly where we're not allowed. I'm here to break those barriers. And the time is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. So, where am I supposed to go when I need God? I've never received anything from God, but I couldn't thank him even if I did. Anywhere. God is spirit, and the time is coming and is now here that it won't matter where you worship, but only that you do it in spirit and truth.
heart and mind. That, that is the kind of worshipper he's looking for. It won't matter where you're from or what you've done. Do you believe what I'm telling you? <laughs> Until the Messiah comes and explains everything and sort this mess out, including me, I don't trust in anyone. You're wrong when you say that you've never received anything from God. This Messiah you speak of, I am he. The first one was named Ramin. You were a woman of purity who was excited to be married. But he wasn't a good man. He hurt you. And it made you question marriage and even the practice of your faith. Stop it. The second was Farzad. On your wedding night, his skin smelled like oranges. And to this day, every time you pass by the oranges in the market, you feel guilty for leaving him because he was the only truly godly man you've been with. But you felt unworthy. Why are you doing this? I have not revealed myself to the public as the Messiah. You are the first. It would be good if you believed me. picked the wrong person. I came to Samaria just to meet you. <laughs> Do you think it's an accident that I'm, I'm here in the middle of the day? I am rejected by others. I know, but not by the Messiah. <sighs> and you know these things, because you are the Christ. I'm going to tell everyone. I was counting on it. <laughs> Spirit and truth. Spirit and truth. It won't be all about mountains or temples. Soon, just the heart. You promise? I promise. This man told me everything I've done. Oh, he must be the Christ! <laughs> Lord Jesus, thank you that you're good. Thank you that your promise is true. Thank you that you love us with a love that is deep and real and you're coming after us. Thank you that you'd come, um, you'd travel to Samaria just to meet that woman and that you're still chasing our heart too. So would you just open up this truth to us this morning and let us see, let us know, let us experience you and let us love you deeply because of who you are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's open this up a little bit and we're going to talk about the heart of God and we're going to talk about uh, the heart of our church. All right. So John chapter four, verse four, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. And it was about the sixth hour. So I need you to picture the scene. Um, you just saw it, but kind of get it in your mind again. Um, it's the sixth hour, meaning it is high noon, ancient Near East desert. It is hot. The disciples and Jesus have just traveled. They're exhausted. They're weary. They're hungry. They're thirsty. And Jesus sent the disciples into town to go get food, and he sat beside 
a well. And I need to just pause, okay? And I want to bring up a point that's it's actually not the main point by any means of this text, but it is this point that we see here, sorry, did I do that? And all throughout the New Testament, okay? And um, we see through the followers of Jesus, we see in the book of Acts, we see in the ministry of Jesus, this amazing point that Jesus and his followers love to go where people gather, love to go to the gathering points of the community. And when we pause and say the well, you need to know that the well is not just a place where people went to get a drink, okay? The well was the place in the community where community happened. Okay, people would go there in the early morning to um, connect and to do business and to hang out. Um, so for example, if you ever travel in England today, there's a real pub culture, okay? People hang out at the pubs. That was the ancient Near Eastern well. If you stop at a Starbucks and you see a little group of ladies hanging out and connecting, that was the ancient well, okay? That was the gathering point. And it's amazing as you tread your fingers through the Bible, you see ministry happening at the gathering points. So let me just kind of walk through a little bit of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 16, uh, the city is Philippi. Paul and some of the other followers of Jesus are wanting to do ministry in Philippi, so they get there, and here's what they didn't do. They didn't put up a tent, hand out flyers, put up screens, and say, everybody, come to us, and we're going to do it like this. No, they said, where are the people gathering. So they said, we know they hang out at the riverside and they pray. So they went to the gathering point to do ministry there. Acts chapter 17, Paul is in Thessalonica, and then Paul is in Athens. And what do they do? Thessalonica, they go to the gathering point at the synagogue. Athens, they go to the marketplace, because that's where people gather. End of Acts 17, they go to the Areopagus, which is uh, Mars Hill, because they know that the philosophers gather there and exchange ideas. They were looking for the wells. They were looking for the gathering points to do ministry. Acts chapter 19, city of Ephesus. Okay, here's what happens. They rented out a place called the Hall of Tyrannus. And there, which was the community center of Ephesus, they did church. And I just want to bring up a point that might seem peripheral, but it's huge to our vision here. Okay? If Paul and Barnabas, or we believe Jesus, were to show up in Lebanon, Ohio, Ohio and say, where should we do ministry? Where, where should we put a church? They would look at Countryside YMCA and say, that seems like a well. People are gathering here. People are connecting here. People are coming here for the, at Countryside right now, 400 clubs, classes, leagues, and lessons. And they'd say, let's coach the teams. Let's be a part of kickboxing class. Let's hang out and drink coffee at the cafe. Let's be here. Let's take the message of Jesus. And as it was said in the first century about the people of Antioch, Let's seep it into the cracks of society. That's how ministry happened. And we want you to know that we love it here. And by the way, we're not, I don't, I don't, many of you don't know this, but over the years, I have been offered pieces of land and buildings that we can build a church on. And we are not stashing money until we get enough money so that we can build a building, okay? We hang out at the well and we love it. Okay, so that's why we're here. So, so watch what Jesus did, though. Not only did he come to get a drink, watch what happened next. Okay, verse 7. Jesus did the unthinkable. A woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, Ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. There were all these barriers up, all these awkward barriers, and Jesus crossed them. And let me just unpack that a little bit. First of all, um, in that day and age, a Jew did not talk to a Samaritan. There's just some ancient history here, and it, the roots go deep and long, okay? The hatred was here, and let me... Let me just kind of tell you why, okay? Um, if you were to go geography, if you were to think of a map, 
in the Holy Land, in south is Judea and Jerusalem, in the north is the Sea of Galilee, and in the middle there's this section called Samaria, okay? And there was a day when the northern and southern kingdom of, of Judah was taken in captivity by the Babylonians. The year was 729 B.C. And when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians took them into captivity, a group of Jews stayed back and said, hey, can we just kind of hang out at home and take care of the homeland? And we will intermarry with the people that took us into captivity, and we'll believe whatever you guys believe. And so they kind of made this, this messed up, synchronistic religion where they said we will believe all the false gods around here we'll just proclaim the first five books of the old testament we'll intermarry with your people and they became over time this um half-breed traders of messed up religion and they were like they're like to a jew they were like the orcs of the ancient world okay it's horrible but they were like these are the like messed up mixed up like like we don't want anything to do with them Keep them away from us. They're, anything they touch is defiled. We don't want them to know the hope of God anymore. And so for Jesus to go through Samaria, remember verse 4 said he had to go through Samaria. It means he was doing something very intentional. He was saying, I actually love her and want to bring the gospel to a Samaritan. And he was willing to break through that awkward barrier, second barrier, she was a woman. And, and this is also strange, but in the ancient world, the status of women was low. And by rabbinical Jewish law, a man was not allowed to talk to a woman. I even have the actual law written down right here. Um, a man shall not be alone with a woman in an inn, not even with his sister or his daughter, on account of what men may think. A man shall not talk with a woman in the street, not even with his own wife, especially not with another woman on account of what men may say. Ancient world, you're a guy walking down the street with your wife, and you're not allowed to talk to her. So never would a Jewish man talk to a Samaritan woman. And then one more barrier. She was a sinner. And I think you caught this in the video clip, but it was the sixth hour of the day when people did not go to the well. And you hear later in the story that she's had five husbands. She would have been considered, this is a small little town of Sychar. She would have been considered, I'm sorry for this, the town prostitute. And look at me, never in a million years would a righteous Jewish rabbi be caught talking to a Samaritan Jewish woman sinner. Not Jewish, Samaritan woman sinner, okay? But Jesus is like, there is something so compelling to me that I'm breaking the barriers. Isn't that awesome? And so let me just kind of pause and kind of come out of this story and into our life story. If you're a follower of Jesus, like, you know that there is hope, that there's healing, that there's light, that there's life that exists. And you also know that there are many people in your life that don't get it, that, that just like maybe think we're talking about a religion or, or a good way of life. They don't understand a relationship with Jesus Christ. And you know what? I don't know if you feel like this, but let me just be very real with you. I often feel awkward talking to people who don't know the Lord about the most important thing in my life, which is the Lord. There's little barriers there. When you think of family members or friends or your kids or your neighbors or your coworkers that don't know the Lord, I just want to plead with you, something that God's been working on in my heart, I want to I plead with you that you would be willing to step through some awkward barriers to tell them the most important thing in your life, to stumble through it a little bit, to, to maybe feel awkward a little bit, but not to let people in your life not know the great hope of your life because having a relationship with Jesus Christ changes everything. And if there's one thing we see from Jesus here, he's like, everybody else go get something to eat and I, I'm here because I love her and I don't care what anybody else says, the barriers, I'm talking to her 
because I want her to know that she can have a relationship with Jesus. And I just ask you that this year you'd be praying about who God has in your life that doesn't know the Lord. Who do you know in your life that just the light bulb hasn't come on yet and they don't know the Lord? And we want to be that kind of church, for goodness sakes. We want to be the kind of church that is telling people about Jesus where the arrows of our life is outward. And I want you to see how Jesus talked about it. It's just brilliant. Okay, of course it is. Watch, watch what he does. Verse 10, let's go there. She said, how can you ask for a drink from me? I'm a Samaritan woman. Watch this. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God, the message version says, if you knew the generosity of God, like if you truly knew God's heart for you and the gift that he wants to give you, who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Meaning, we're talking about physical water, we're talking about thirst, but there's a water that I give that is alive. There is a thirst that needs to be quenched deep in you that is alive. I have living water. The woman said to him, sir, you got nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. And Jesus said to her, verse 13, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Okay, they're talking about water. They're talking about thirst. They're talking about how people are thirsty. But Jesus talks about this physical need and raises it up to a brand new level and says basically, lady, you think we're talking about water, but there's a type of water that only I can give. And the great thing about the water that I can give is that it quenches the deepest thirst of your soul. You think I'm thirsty? In a spiritual sense, you are thirsty, and there is only one thing that can quench that thirst, and it's the living water of Jesus Christ. And look at me. There are some of you in this room, and you are thirsty right now. You have a deep soul thirst within you right now. You're craving for something. There's some of you watching online, and there's, there's this thing that you're craving for, and you don't know what it is, and you're trying this, you're trying this, you're trying this, you're trying this, searching for a satisfaction, and the answer is Jesus. You've been designed by God to have the deepest thirst of your soul met by a relationship with him, and that's all that matters. And he says, I have this living water, and, and then watch what he does. It's going to seem harsh and cold, but then it will make sense. She's like, give me some of that. And he goes, why don't you go call your husband? Which the first time, second time, tenth time I read this, I was like, ouch, that, that seems harsh in the middle of like this joyful living water conversation. Why don't you go call your husband? She says, uh, well, let me just read it. Verse 16. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. You've had five husbands. The one you have is not your husband. What you've said is true. What, why does Jesus zero in on this vulnerable, painful, broken part of her heart? Why does he say, yes, you're thirsty? And by the way, go call your husband. I know you don't have one. You've gone from relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship to relationship, and you're on number six. What is Jesus doing? Here's what he's doing. He's saying, let me point out the pattern of thirst in your life and to show you what you're trying to meet this deep soul thirst with. You've gone after six different relationships because you're thirsty and you're trying to quench that thirst with a guy, and you're still thirsty. And 
I, I know that nobody in this room like can fully relate to a first century ancient Near East Samaritan town prostitute, and yet, look at me in the eyes. That's our story too. That's your story too. It can be the guy who's, who's saying, if I will just achieve this level of promotion, I'll finally meet this like longing deep within me. Work late hours, work late hours. Maybe I'll get it. It's the girl that's staring in the mirror and saying, if I can just get my body down to that body image, I'll finally be satisfied. It's the guy clicking on a computer screen saying, I know I don't need to go here. I know it's bad for me to go here, but maybe it'll kind of quench your thirst. Go here, more thirsty. It's the student who's saying, I've got to get an A, I've got to get an A, I've got to get achieved, and then maybe it will meet this deep satisfaction. It's the person who's saying, if I just get this new gadget, if I just get iPhone 18, I don't know, if I just get whatever the technological gadget is, maybe it'll meet a deep soul thirst within me. It's the shopaholic, alcoholic, workaholic, sportsaholic, fill in the blank aholic. It's everybody saying, if I can just maybe numb down that thirst and get some, I will be satisfied. And Jesus was saying then, and Jesus is saying now, that there's only one thing that will meet the deep soul thirst of your life. It's Jesus Christ. It's a relationship with Jesus. And when you drink of that water, it quenches the soul thirst and the Bible says you actually become a living fountain so that when you continue to drink deeply from the living water of Jesus, others can sense it from you and drink off of the passion of your life flowing in and out of you. You go from a thirsty vessel to a living fountain. Isn't that beautiful? The book of Jeremiah says, I've got two things against my people. One you have neglected the source of living water too. You've built for yourself cracked cisterns that cannot hold water. You're neglecting God and you're trying to drink from something that won't even hold water. And look at me, that's us. That's you. That's our story. Until you know Jesus. She's like, you must be a prophet. All right, let me push into this. Here's the deal. Your people say, like, you can only meet God in the temple. We can't even go in the temple. Our people say, you got to go on, mount, on this mountain, Zeredim, over here to worship God. You guys say, worship him on your mountain. I can't even meet God. And Jesus looks at her, and I just love this part. You saw this in the clip. He said, the day is coming. The day is now here when the kind of worshipers that I'm looking for will worship me in spirit and in truth. It's not about the places it's about the heart. It's spirit and in truth. Truth will study the Lord and learn from the Lord and know the Lord and know his word. Spirit, we will be people that hear his voice and know his gentle nudgings and are alive with the spirit of God within us. It's about the mind. It's about the heart. It's about the truth. It's about the presence of God. And Jesus said, I'm changing the game, breaking the barriers. I want my people to know me in spirit and in truth. And we're going to be a church that worships the Lord in spirit and in truth. We will open up God's word and say, this is what God is saying. Let the truth feed your mind. And then we will say, spirit of the living God, do whatever you want to do. Aflame our hearts with you because we want to know you in spirit. We want to know you in truth. And when we calibrate those two together, we become true worshipers. And that's what we want to be. That's what we want to be. We want to be worshipers of the living God. And then watch, watch what happens. Watch how this story kind of unfolds. Um, the woman says, hey, I guess when the Messiah comes, he'll straighten all this mess out, including me. And Jesus says, I am the Messiah. And a light bulb goes on and... Verse 31, the disciples get back and they're like, what is going on? Why are you talking to her? We just went to get food. Like, you're still hungry, right? Like, can we talk about food? And watch what Jesus says, verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. 
But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has, has anybody brought him something to eat? I love this. The disciples are like, we got food. Have you eaten yet? Jesus is like, I got greater stuff than food going on. Has anybody fed the man? Um, sound like my boys, I think. That's what I, I like that part. Um, verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, then come the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. And this is what I want you to know. Jesus and the followers of Jesus throughout the New Testament looked to do ministry where people were already gathering. Can I tell you why we meet here? We want to do the same thing. Jesus looked to break through awkward barriers to tell people about the greatest news that you can be in a relationship with Jesus Christ, that you can have living water. And we want to do the same thing here. That's why we want to be outward. Jesus looked to round up a group of people that will worship him in spirit and in truth. That's what we want to have. That's what we want to have here. And so, so I'd love to, for the rest of this message, for just a few minutes, I'd love to um, uh, sort of put my visionary hat on and share with you a little bit about this story that we are connected to, which is the story of the YMCA. Um, and why we do church in a YMCA, why we're, why we're here, and why we believe that God actually has a pretty amazing story for us to be here. So can I tell you that? When I say YMCA, most people in the world think of family-friendly gym and swim and an awful song by the village people with crazy hand motions. If that's what you think, I hope to blow your mind. 1821, can I have a picture? There's a young man by the name of George Williams who was wandering around in his farm in England. And he felt God stirring with him. And he felt God moving him to a higher purpose. And he said, I don't think I'm meant to be a farmer. How about I get a job at a drape factory? And so he did. Ultimately, he wound up in London, 19 years old. George Williams looked around. He was a brand new believer. He just got his heart drenched with living water, and he looked around at his 150 employees in this drape factory, and he said, there is nobody here that truly understands the hope of Jesus Christ, and I don't even know what to tell him. What should I do? And he said, I'll do the only thing I know how to do, and he began to pray name by name for his other 150 employees, and one by one by one, they came to know Jesus Christ until all 150 employees including the boss, became followers of Jesus. And 12 of them gathered in this upper dorm room in London, got down on their knees and said, God is beginning a movement here. What should we call ourselves? And they chose the name the Young Men's Christian Association. Okay? And John Mott, this very famous Christian leader, once looked back and interviewed George Williams and said, what did you have in your mind when you formed the Young Men's Christian Association? And he said this, we had one thing in mind, that we would know Jesus and tell the hope of Jesus to those who are far from him. The YMCA began not as like a club to, to swim and play basketball and a song, okay? It was to share the hope of Jesus Christ with this world, to be a lighthouse of the community. And it began to spread, it began to spread, it began to spread until in 11 short years, it spread almost all over the world. And people said, that, that's a revival. And delegates came from all over the world to a place in Paris, France, okay? And they formed the global mission statement of the YMCA. And this is what it is, okay? Um, and this is important. I'm gonna read this to you and it's gonna sound like maybe an archaic phrase. But it's important because I want you to know that this is still the global purpose statement of the YMCA. I've been to the Y in almost every continent, okay? And I've stood in little 
villages in India. I've stood in um, places all over Europe. I've stood all over Asia, parts of Africa. I've seen men and women clutch their hearts and quote the Paris basis, saying this is what we're about, okay? And here's what it says. Young Men's Christian Association seeks to unite those young men who are regarding Jesus as their God and Savior, according to the Holy Scriptures, desire to be his disciples in their faith and in their life, and to associate their efforts for the extension of the kingdom amongst young men. Okay, there's four principles to this. The YMCA exists to exalt Jesus, to be his disciples, to be faithful to God's word, and to spread God's kingdom. Okay? And let me just ask you a question. All right, why, why do we meet here? Why do we think that this is a community gathering point that is, like, worthy to meet in? This is the only community gathering point that I can think of in the world where we can point to the purpose statement and say, that's what you guys care about because that's all we care about. Why don't we help you guys care about what you care about? It's ultimately, ultimately this lighthouse for Jesus Christ. This last week, uh, the celebration of basketball happened, okay? It was James Naismith Day. I don't know if you know this. James Naismith, who once uh, began basketball by, by putting two peach baskets on side of the gym, calling out ten rules and saying, here's what we're going to do. It's going to be kind of like rugby, kind of like football, and kind of like soccer, except we'll take the ball and we'll throw it into the peach basket. And when it lands there, game over, because they didn't have um, a bottom of the peach basket. It developed a little bit. But, but anyways, they asked James Naismith, what is the work of the YMCA physical director? And this is what he said, to win men for the master through the gym. The YMCA created basketball. It created volleyball. It created racquetball. It created weightlifting. It created all these sports. The YMCA is the largest global movement of sports in the world. And outside of the local church, it is the largest, I'll put this in quotes, Christian organization in the world. There's 14,000 global locations. And look at me, this is so important for where we're going as a church. We believe that the light has somewhat dimmed and it's somewhat asleep. And God is calling us to help wake it up. There's a story by uh, Napoleon, when Napoleon once gathered his generals in a tent, and he unfurled this map, and he actually circled the country of China. And he said, men, this is a sleeping giant, but if she wakes up, the whole world will tremble. And we believe, part of the reason that we plant a church in a YMCA and help plant churches and YMCAs, and help tell the story of the YMCA, is that we think this is one of those beautiful streams in the great river of a mighty revival that will come and wake up the world. Okay. Do you believe that, by the way? I hope you do. Right now, there's 2,750 YMCAs in the U.S. There are churches in more than 1,500 of them. Okay. And what we do, I don't know if you realize this, but part of what I do is help to coach other church plants. Part of what we do as a, as a church is people will come in all the time and say, teach us how to plant a church in Hawaii. And we just want number after number to grow until 14,000 are reached. And the giant wakes up and the great commission spreads over all the world. And then Jesus will come again. And we'll look him in the eyes and he'll say, did you do every?" you can for the sake of the God and we'll say yes we were faithful to the calling of God and it may seem like we're just this little kind of maybe I don't know somewhat insignificant church in Lebanon Ohio and I don't understand this I don't understand this one bit but it's the largest Christian organization in the world 14,000 global locations and the largest YMCA in the world is not in Mexico City it's not in Paris it's not in London it's not in Hong Kong it's not in Pyongyang North Korea it's not in Atlanta it's not in Chicago the largest YMCA in the world is the one that we're sitting in in Lebanon Ohio it doesn't make sense outside of the fact that we have a global 
calling to come to this well, to bring the living water, to relight this lighthouse, and to help wake up the giant. Let me pray. Jesus, we love you. Thank you that we get to be a church that is part of something that's big. And thank you that we can be people that just like Jesus was willing to go after this heart of this woman in the middle of the day, in the middle of nowhere. Thank you that we can know that you're coming after us. You're coming after us, God. You love us and you want us to drink of living water. You want us to know you deeply. You want, you want our hearts, God. And I thank you for the beautiful truth that when we know this God that's coming after us and it's matched with a pursuit of us going after you, that a relationship happens that, that changes everything. So we love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray, amen. Um, we're going to pause as we conclude the service and we're going to take communion together. We do this almost every week here uh, because we love to remember. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. And I don't know about you, but I'm prone to forget so many things. And Jesus is like, do this to remember. Keep remembering, keep remembering. That the reason that this is possible is because of the body and the blood of Jesus. He was nail-stabbed to Roman wood, and he bled and died to pay the penalty for our sins and to win the victory against sin, hell, death, and Satan. And he rose from the grave in victory, buying our way to freedom, that anybody who believes in Jesus and receives him and says, I don't want to just live like this is some religion that I got to perform and do. I want to receive you and follow you as King, Savior, Lord of my life, that the chase of God and the chase of man confront and a relationship begins and you can know Jesus. And we take communion to remember that, to remember that and to live in that and to celebrate that. So I'd ask you, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus like that, or if you're watching online and you don't know Jesus, there's nothing that we would rather do than to tell you about him. Uh, come find one of us after the service. And for those of you that are followers of Jesus, take communion to remember him. Take a few moments, and when the time is right, go ahead and take communion.